Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, some of you may know how the process of call day at the seminary works, but some of you may not. It is a big special time around campus, and everyone is trying to figure out where exactly it is that they are going. See, for a pastor in our church body, when you come out of school, you don't really have a ton of say about where you're going to go. And you don't find out until a mere few months before you're going to be moving wherever it is that they send you. And you find out on call day, a big service on campus, all the students that are receiving their calls are sitting up front, and the excitement is palpable and maybe a little bit of worry. And you walk up and they say, Adam Thompson received a call from, and you along with everybody else find out where you're going to be living for who knows how long. But during the time leading up to that day, we're all trying to guess what God has in store for us. And in that process, it can be really hard to keep our mind on the things of God. We want to think about, well, where is it going to be? How close is it to our family? What kind of church is it going to be? How big is it? Now, throughout the process, we get to put our preferences out there. We talk about our experience and what type of ministry we'd like to do. And it can be hard in that process to remember that ultimately it's not up to us where we go. And if we learn anything from Peter today, it's a good thing that it's not up to us. Well, regardless of where it is that they send you, you go. I was sent to Fairlawn, Ohio, never heard of it before, never been there, and now I'm living there in a few months. You can think you know where you're going to go, and you can think that you know the plans that God has in store for you, but come call day, you find out what's really going to be happening. Have you ever felt a tension like this in your own life? You're thinking about the future and the way things are supposed to be. And you have your plans. What's that saying that if you want to make God laugh, tell Him your plans? And it can be really difficult when you're in the midst of making all of those plans to keep your mind on the things of God and not on the things of man, not on the things that we want, but rather on the things that God wants. Well, as I shared with the children today, I have good news for you. If you answer any of those questions, yes, you're not uniquely bad. We all have that at one point or another, and even Peter, one of the twelve disciples of Jesus, suffers from the same problem today in our gospel reading. When we look at the Scripture, Peter has got the same issue. He's got plans for the future. He even has plans for the future for Jesus. And he doesn't really care what Jesus has to say about what those plans will be. He knows. And in our gospel reading today, it comes out, the truth is out, that Peter, he knows what's best for what the Messiah is going to do. And now that Jesus has shared what the future holds for him, Peter's going to say, I don't think so. That's not how this works, Jesus. I don't know who told you how to be the Messiah, but that's not correct. Let me tell you what you're going to do. And it's quite striking, especially if you've been reading sequentially through Matthew, because just before this, Peter gets probably the highest praise from Jesus in all the Bible, because he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So we go from that to get behind me, Satan. That's quite the change. And it's certainly a phrase that always gets your attention. Because the title of Christ had an expectation. And so when Jesus confirmed to Peter 
that you are correct, I am the Christ. And then we get to our first verse of our reading today, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. It doesn't matter if it's Peter or anyone else, this isn't the plan for the Messiah. You're not going to Jerusalem to suffer at the hands of people and get killed. That's not what the Messiah is here to do. And Peter is just the unfortunate stand-in for the rest of us who has the courage to voice his convictions straight to Jesus' face. Peter even takes Jesus aside, it says, and he begins to rebuke him. Right? It says rebuke. He's there telling Jesus, nah, Jesus, this is what's going to happen. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Well, like I shared with the kids, it's a good thing Jesus didn't listen to Peter. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be gathered here in church this morning. We'd be hopeless. No salvation would have been done because Jesus would have been like every other king that had ever lived rather than the Son of the living God, the Christ, who has come to make all things new. You see, there are a lot of expectations about the Christ. Some hoped they would, He would be a mighty king with lots of worldly power to throw off the yoke of the Romans, establishing a mighty empire. Some people still hope for that. Others thought He would be a wise and influential teacher and prophet. But regardless of the expectation or theory, the Christ, Jesus doesn't fit any of them. Because the plan and the will that He is obeying is not of this world, but of His Father in heaven. And it's grander and greater than anything we could come up with. I've been reading a book lately, um, Kingdom, Grace, and Judgment, and in it he makes this distinction between the way that Jesus uses power in the left-handed kingdom. It's weird and it's alien and it doesn't seem to make sense to us. And he's always surrounded by people, his disciples, or when he's tempted by the devil in the wilderness, to use the right-handed kingdom power just through overwhelming might to just set things right. And any time that power of Jesus comes through, everyone is excited. If you recall the feeding of the 5,000, right after that happens, they want to do what with Jesus? They want to make Him king. And Jesus refuses every step of the way to use power to set things right. Because He knows that Peter, along with everyone else, they don't really know what they're saying. If God was going to use the right-hand power to make things right, then we are His enemies and we must be destroyed. But God has a different plan in mind to turn His enemies into His friends, His beloved children. And so something else is needed the strange alien work of our Lord Jesus Christ that seems for all the world to be weakness and suffering and failure, and yet it works out a greater victory than any we could imagine. But imagine, put yourself in Peter's shoes for a moment. What would your reaction be? It's just been confirmed to you, you don't know the rest of the story yet that this Jesus you've been following is in fact the Messiah. He said it Himself now. And then the very next thing He tells you is that He's going off to Jerusalem to die. I think I would probably react the same way, with the same sort of arrogance that Peter does, the same sort of ignorance. In fact, if I'm being honest, I often do. So do you. How often this happens to us, where we put our hearts, we set them on the things of men and not the things of God. Think about your own life. When are you setting your mind on the things of men instead of God? Is it when you decide how to prioritize your time? 
Or maybe it's when you decide how to spend your money. Or maybe it's how sure you are in your own ability to forge your future yourself. This plan that you have that you're just so sure is the best one, and you'll not be deterred. I'm going to go to this school. I'm going to work this job. I'm going to marry this type of person. I'm going to live in this type of house or this type of place. It happens so easily, so quickly. And often the weird thing is we don't notice right away, do we? Because it's not usually in a direct attack on our faith in God. Nobody's standing in front of you saying, renounce Jesus. It's usually more subtle than that. And before you know it, you look around and the things of faith that you normally would have done, you haven't been doing for months. And you didn't even notice. There's a new book coming out called The Great Dechurching. And it's highlighting the fact that 40 million adults in America today used to go to church and no longer do. That's the largest number of people leaving a church in that short span of time in history. But you know what's really interesting? More so to me than that number, as big as it is, is that 75% of those people, they just stopped coming to church. Usually, when we think of people who've left the church, we all think of the story of somebody, some offensive word was spoken, somebody was ignored and not cared for, and they were upset and angry, and they left the church either in sorrow or in anger. But 75% of that 40 million people, they just stopped coming. They, they couldn't recall anything in, in particular. You see, it's often us following some lesser good thing for ourselves, our family, or our children that slowly walks us away. And before we know it, God seems far away. I think you know what I'm talking about, those moments when you look around and you realize, I've been dealing with a problem and I haven't prayed yet. When I look around and maybe some random thing got me back in my Bible or I looked at my verse the day on a Bible app and realized... I haven't read my Bible in months. Yeah, it happens to me too. Or maybe it's you realized, oh, I was just taking a couple weeks off from church and then five months went by. I got out of the habit and now it seems so hard to get back. So what do we do with this knowledge that this happens to us? That as fallen human beings... It's so easy for us to put our mind on the things of man rather than God. Well, our gospel reading today gives us two pieces to note here. One is, you shouldn't be afraid of God's judgment even in this case. Even his disciple Peter has the same problem. And Peter and you and me are precisely the people that this weird alien work of Jesus came to redeem rather than destroy. And it's made quite striking because it's right after Peter does something great. Hasn't that happened to you? You've had a great week. You've made great decisions. You're feeling great. You've been reading your Bible for weeks and weeks, and then it just stops. Maybe you don't even remember how it happened. It just happened. Well, when you read about this with Peter, we can say, join the club. Jesus came for you, too. He came to redeem you, too. But it's also a wake-up call because Jesus doesn't just let this slide. He looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Now, whose benefit do you think he's saying that for, his own or for Peter's? He wants to draw Peter back to the things of God. And so maybe when this has happened to you, there's been suffering in your life as a result of it. And it can be easy to think, well, the suffering is just all bad and we want to avoid that. But sometimes God uses that suffering to point us back to Him, to call us back to the things of God, to refocus us on Him. And that's what He does. See, God sent Peter and you and me a helper so that we can keep our mind on the things of God. His helper is the Holy Spirit. He came to the church on Pentecost, and you can see from here 
to Peter on Pentecost a massive difference. Even leading up to Jesus' death, he cowers in the face of people associating him with Jesus. But after Pentecost, he stands in front of a crowd of thousands and preaches Jesus Christ crucified. You have that same spirit in you that now you know and can believe by the grace of the Holy Spirit that the things of God were accomplished in Jesus for you. And so now when we, like Peter, wander and our minds move from the things of God to the things of man, God has things in place to call you back to Him. He has pastors who He calls to serve His church to preach the Word of God. He has family members and fellow believers who aren't content to let you drift, who pray for you, who speak to you, who have hard conversations and risk relational hurt because of their love for you and their desire for you to know that Jesus came for you too. By the grace of God today, you came to church to hear the things of God given to you once again. The very same things given to Peter all those years ago are given to you today. The Messiah, the Son of the living God, has called you back to Himself. Maybe today's a rebuke for you. Maybe the law of the Scriptures today stings. Or maybe the sweet relief of the gospel is healing you in your despair, reminding you that, yeah, even though I I am a screw-up, Jesus is the proof that God loves me. You came and you confessed your sins again today. And maybe it was some of the same ones that cling to you regularly. Maybe it was a new one. But yet again, you received the same response from Jesus. The same thing of God, the forgiveness of sins for repentant sinners. You received the gift of His Word and in faith your response was, thanks be to God. And He doesn't stop there today. We're going to go on, and He's going to give you specifically the body and blood of Jesus, the fruits of the very thing that Jesus has just begun to tell His disciples He is here to do, to take their sin into His body, to die on the cross in their place, to make them into something new, no longer an enemy of God, but a friend a beloved child. Today you will receive that gift and in it receive the things of God, the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus, His body and blood given and shed for you. Dear friends in Christ, these are the things of God. They are not things of wrath and judgment, but of mercy. They're not things of right-handed power, of war and of conquest, but rather of peace. They're not the things of rejection or exclusion, but the things of love. Set your mind on these things and know that God has delivered you from all that can harm you. In the name of Jesus, amen.